I, I usually say good evening, but I think I'll just say good late afternoon because it's still very bright outside and, and it just have been a wonderful day. Um, welcome to the Manil. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Paul Davis, Curator of Collections. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to the, tonight's program, um, which is being recorded and will be made available uh, via the Manil's YouTube channel. Um, so if you haven't done so already, please silent your cell silence your cell phones. Um, and then kindly hold your questions to the end of the program so that we can uh, bring a microphone around to you so you can ask questions. Uh, uh, just a quick reminder to stay up to date uh, with future Manil programs by visiting the manil.org, our website, or better yet, uh, to uh, become a member and we can send you a newsletter and keep you updated. Um, the support of Manil members helps keep the museum and its public programs free and open to everyone. So this evening's program is the last of the Manil's programs uh, associated with the exhibition Are the Cameron Grassfields, a Living Heritage in Houston, which celebrates enduring artistic traditions from the Cameron Grassfields and its global diaspora here in our city. Uh, the exhibition will be on view until July 9th. Um, and although this is the last official Manil program, uh, La Faba, La Fami Bamaleke de Houston will be doing a summer program uh, their big summer festival, and we will be communicating that with, with uh, our Manil members if you would like to attend. Uh, but it's a real pleasure tonight to welcome uh, Dr. Victoria Massey. Uh, Dr. Victoria Massey is Assistant Professor of Medical Anthropology in the Department of, of Anthropology at Rice University with affiliate appointments in the Center for African and American, uh, African and African American Studies the Medical Humanities Program, and the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality, as well as the Science and Technology Studies Program. She is also a member of the Ethnographic uh, Design Collaborative inside the Anthropology Department. But at heart, Dr. Massey is a passionate writer who works, whose work transcends the traditional boundaries of anthropology, journalism, and oral histories and fiction. Her, um, her forthcoming book project, Prospecting Return, The Gift of Genetic Reconnection in Cameroon, examines how genetic reconnection programs in Cameroon are creating opportunities for Africans to redefine post-colonial independence through African Americans' genetically catalyzed return home. And in that sense, tonight's program is a real wonderful extension of the exhibition. Drawing on her ethnographic fieldwork in Central West Africa and the United States uh, for her book project, Dr. Massey's talk will explore the imbricated and historically complex ways in which African Americans and Cameroonians are connecting through genetic ancestry as part of a poetic approach to kinship, solidarity, and personhood. It's an honor to have her with us this evening, and thank you, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Massey to the podium. Good afternoon slash good evening, everyone. Um, again, I, before I begin, I just wanna say thank you so much to the Manil Collection, particularly Paul Davis for offering this opportunity. It's been a year in the making, I was realizing, <laughs> looking back at the original email, um, just to invite me to see the Manil and learn more about the exhibition. So I'm very deeply honored and excited to be closing out um, the discussion happening around um, the Living Heritage um, exhibition tonight. So I won't say more about myself, but rather for the sake of this talk, um, I'm going to do, it's a bit experimental. Um, and so what I'm actually going to start us off um, with is a bit of, exper of, of experimental writing, um, what I call, um, part one of Albert Perry, a biomythography. In March 2013, researchers at the University of Arizona published a study in the American Journal of Human Genetics, confirming that an African-American family's Y chromosome uprooted the foundations of modern man's phylogenetic tree. The family sought out Houston-based genetic ancestry testing company, Family Tree DNA for their services. 
Their request was ordinary. Their genetic material was not. The previous year, as this family shared their DNA in hopes of finding out information about their ancestral origins, to the chagrin of the family and the broader scientific community, their Y chromosome had no origin that could be found amongst the Y chromosome variants birthed by, from genetic Adam. Indeed, this family's Y chromosome provided an alternative rendering of mankind's descent. Genetic Adam allegedly existed between 60,000 and 140,000 years ago. By contrast, this family's paternal ancestry split off from Adam's people over 330,000 years ago. With the earliest human fossils dating back 195,000 years in East Africa, this African American family's Y chromosome appeared to be older than humanity itself. Puzzled by the situation, researchers surveyed a database consisting of over 5,000 samples taken from 10 different African countries. To their credit, a match was found. 11 identical quote-unquote ancient chromosomes were found in the sample of 173 people belonging to what they defined as the Mbo ethnic group in southwest Cameroon. As John Wilkins, a geneticist at the Ronan Institute in Montclair, New Jersey, told New Scientist at the time, we geneticists have been looking at Y chromosomes about as long as we've been looking at anything. Changing where the root of the Y chromosome tree is at this point is extremely surprising. A new ancient or African origin story had been revealed. With it, a new name had become central to the genesis of man itself, Albert Perry. Perry was born into slavery sometime between 1819 and 1827. Living out his life in York County, South Carolina, Perry's family had a particular problem with their roots that his contemporary abolitionist Frederick Douglass would explain plainly in his 1855 autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom. Quote, genealogical trees do not flourish among slaves. A person of some consequence here in the North sometimes designated father, is literally abolished in slave law and slave practice. It is only once in a while that an exception is found to this statement. Perry was never meant to have paternity because his paternal ancestry was never meant to be known. His fate and that of his folks rested instead in what the U.S. chattel slavery system deemed to be of their best use the meticulously anonymized raw material of empire. As had been meticulously inscribed onto the African bodies made flesh upon their arrival in slavery ports like Charleston, a little more than 200 miles southwest of York County, African ancestry was the material against which the nucleus of the American family was forged. According to the laws of this land, proper progenitors were property owners, not property like Perry and proper progenitors had no need and no obligation to entertain or recognize the quote-unquote curiosities that they owned. Nearly two centuries later, the direct-to-consumer marketplace appears to have ushered in a reckoning with the central tenets of this father right and the visual aids with which this was made self-evident. By simply sharing a sample of saliva, Perry's great-grandson, at the behest of a female cousin who did not have the genetic material to take the test herself, dared to seek out information about his paternal ancestry that in Perry's time had been unthinkable to inquire into, least of all answer. And the answer that we found was one that beckoned us to take stock of the repercussions of that omission. As Pierre Bartholomew explained for Le Monde, Perry's Y chromosome challenged the quote unquote tree as an appropriate model for mapping modern man's evolutionary history. In my translation from the original French, Bartholomew wrote, how could Albert Perry, who was no doubt a homo sapien, be carrying a Y chromosome dating back to an ancient human when all his fellow humans had a more recent version of the Y chromosome? Baffling, not really. If we consider that the evolutionary story of man is not linear, but is similar to a bush whose branches split up, then cross each other again. One hypothesis to account for this ancient Y chromosome today was that it derived from a case of interbreeding between modern humans and an ancient human population. 
Human fossils had been exhumed in Iwo Ileru, Nigeria in 2011, not far from where the Peri Y chromosome carriers reside in Cameroon, just along the border between the two countries. Like these remains, Perry's great-grandson's DNA test results displayed a confoundingly similar mixture of ancient and modern human features, but it still told us nothing about the biographical nature of this resemblance. University of, of Arizona researchers concluded that Perry's Y chromosome was not representative of Sub-Saharan Africa. It would be scientifically inappropriate to scale that small but consequential time frame of the transatlantic slave trade from the 15th to the 19th century to that of the human evolutionary, of human evolutionary history. Perry's Y chromosome instead fortified Africa's well-known but clearly underestimated levels of genetic diversity. As the researchers concluded in their article, the novelty of this Y chromosome instead demonstrated a scientific need for quote unquote more dense and even sampling across the continent. And yet, it would also appear to be scientifically dishonest to deny the scientific discovery's debts to the countless lives that were remade in the wake of the plantation created for chattel slavery. And who could now remake themselves and everyone else unexpectedly anew through genetic information? In a testament to direct to consumer citizen science, a simple genetic ancestry test ushered in the arrival of a new Adam. Perry was resurrected from the obscurity the United St States meant to make of him. And with Perry, geneticists were forced to look to Africa with new eyes. Genetic ancestry testing was unlocking new information about the human condition. The deracinated story of modern humans originating in Africa, freely migrating elsewhere, was usurped by the living specter of ships filled to the brim with stolen human cargo. From the bowels of the barracoon, the descendants of the enslaved were bridging a gap between what men knew they were and what they had to learn they might be including something or someone that they did not recognize. From Africa's hinterlands to Europe, North America, South America, and the Caribbean, the world found its way back to the Atlantic African coastline where Perry's Y chromosome resurfaced through a DNA test, Cameroon. I wanted to begin this talk with this piece of creative writing, which I'm calling a biomythography. The term itself is derived from the form originally birthed by black feminist lesbian warrior poet Audre Lorde in her publication of Zami, a new spelling of my name in 1982. The goal for her was to provide a model to reconsider the limits of autobiography at the creative interstices of mythology, history, and biography. As an anthropologist who also takes the craft of writing seriously, somewhere in between the space between poetry and creative nonfiction, I chose this genre as a kind of creative challenge for myself. But it is also an attempt to recapture the kind of biomythography that is unfolding around how we understand the myths of biological information today. Here, I am thinking about the work of people like Sylvia Winter, who, when it comes to understanding our ideas of man, are often challenging us to consider not just necessarily biological truths, but the ways that those truths are trafficked in metaphors about a certain kind of, uni a kind of essentialized idea of what man could be. And so for me, for this talk, what was interesting to me about Albert Perry as an opening is in many respects because it kind of created an opening about how to understand my own project in 2013 when he arrived, when the story arrived on my Facebook feed. In March 2013, I was finishing up my second year of my PhD program. My research interest in genetic ancestry had expanded considerably. What had at first began as a creative nonfiction essay reflecting on what genetic ancestry meant for our 21st century understandings of how race is not biological, my sophomore year of college, had led me unexpectedly to Cameroon. In 2010, 
Cameroon gained attention by becoming the first African country to host a quote unquote delegation of African Americans in their DNA certified country of origin through a program called the Ancestry Connection Program or ARP. The 10 day all expense paid program coincided with the 50th anniversary of independence. The aim of the program as I would learn when I first arrived in the country in 2011 for the second and last ARP, was to rewrite, quote, the second half of the slavery story, the return by choice over open skies to the land from which their African Americans' ancestors were forced out in chains and over turbulent waters of DNA certified members of the African diaspora. This was, on the one hand, the, genetic, the gift genetic reconnection offered to African Americans by inviting them to come back home. But as a trip largely organized by American Cameroonians based in the DC suburbs, who reached out to black owned and operated genetic ancestry testing company, African Ancestry, the gift of genetic reconnection seemed to have little to do with DNA per se. Rather, the gift of this particular exchange seemed to be like the Perry White chromosome a rearrangement of the nature of fate and the profound circumstantial alignments that genetic information obliged that I could not see coming without the wisdom of hindsight. The problem of fate is not new for genetics. In 1996, on the eve of the unveiling of the Human Genome Project, the late anthropologist Paul Rabinow anticipated that genetics would absolutely reconfigure our ideas of our biological fate. As a consequence of sequencing the, gene, the human genome, we were acquiring a new vocabulary with which to talk about ourselves, a specific allele, a mutation, or haplotype, or something like a genetic profile. But rescaling our sense of ourselves to sequences of nucleotides, we were not only remaking the mirror with which we see ourselves, we were also transforming the conditions of whether and how we could see our hands in the process. Take for example, the image shown here. One of the exercises that I often do when I teach about genetics is provide students with an image of a series of nucleotides. With the image, I ask them, like I will ask you all this evening, can anyone tell me what this says? I typically have one of two, or of two responses. The first is silence. The second, which we did not have here tonight, is that an ambitious student who is able to immediately draw on their own scientific literacy of what the random sequences of A's, T's, and C's, and G's, in green, yellow, blue, and red respectively referred to will tell me that they're nucleotide based pairs, adenine, thymine, cytine, cytosine, guanine, the very foundations of the stairs that make up the iconic image of a spiraling double helix. But that's not necessarily what I'm asking. For that reason, I ask them again, okay, what does that mean? It is at that point that they too are silent. This is a quintessential example of what biological anthropologist Jonathan Marx would coin as the molecular fallacy a few years after Rabinow. Quote, the problem is that in being told about these data, these sequences, without a context in which to interpret them, we are left with our own cultural devices to impart meaning to them. Indeed, as we define DNA as the quote unquote book of life, that sequences allow us to allegedly read. We forget one key aspect of this particular practice of literacy. Genetic information cannot and does not necessarily tell us anything about ourselves that we do not tell it to tell us back. Indeed, genetic information is not rhetorical. Instead, we make it that way. Genetic ancestry is a quintessential example of how easy this distinction between whether or not it is rhetorical can be. 
As demonstrated by the evolutionary phylogenetics tree more familiar visual cousin, the genealogical family tree we have developed is a kind of objective visual metric for how, generation, how we understand generations connect and disconnect from one another. Scaled to help us look back only a handful of generations, we can see each branch of our family genealogy as a kind of historical maneuvering of blood through sex and marriage. The individual names of the people who bore us and who by extension bore them may change. But the nature of how our respective family trees expand and are fortified is at its root assumed to be the same. Geneticizing genealogy only seems to refer to these dynamics naturally. For instance, sex-specific inheritance patterns of white chromosomes and mitochondrial DNA are used to infer information about our paternal and maternal ancestry respectively. The white chromosome is only passed down to other white chromosome holders. Mitochondrial DNA, by extension, is material that everyone inherits from the person who births them, but can only be passed on by those who do not also have a white chromosome. At face value, it would appear to be that the direct-to-consumer pursuit of ancestry is merely following the natural flow of genetics. But 2008 would be the year in which I would have to reckon with the other quote-unquote unconscious optics embedded in the test for, for myself. One evening that fall, I received an unexpected email from my father, the family genealogist. It was a PDF of his maternal and paternal ancestry results. Unlike the Perry family, there was no question that the Massey Y chromosome was genetically quote unquote human. The question was instead whether the Massey Y chromosome would be unburdened by the baggage of racial dispossession. It was not. The front page was a seductive visual choreography of precision. Boldly highlighted in a box on the top right corner, I was made aware that I was connected to the E3A paternal haplogroup, also conveniently referred to as the language people. Navigating the fine line between ancient ancestors and present day places, it was written that my people broadly, quote, may have lived in West and Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly Cameroon and Benin. Nonetheless, just above the accompanying table listing my father's mutations, the point of identifying what my paternal ancestry was based on, based on where we were from, seemed to go no further than information we had without a genetic test. Namely, that someone that we were related to at some point in the past, in all likelihood came from some place in the African continent beyond the bounds of the Maghreb. That was in fact the quintessential logic of the US one drop rule that had shaped my African ancestry since my family's arrival in North Carolina, just 250 miles east of Perry. My African ancestry in the US was not conferred on the basis of shared blood, but on the shared circumstances of being reduced to the color line inscribed in my flesh and the flesh of the folks I had grown to know and call, call family. For this very reason, African ancestry was not guaranteed for my father simply because he is black. Rather, what I had been now guaranteed in the map staring back at me was that genetics, in Sadia Hartman's terms, was becoming the latest terrain for slavery to take on its latest afterlife. In a map of Africa, with Sub-Saharan Africa highlighted in orange, genetic information had been made to project back to me and others with my haplogroup a Victorian era racial geography of black Africa that could be made to withstand the test of time. Not only did this override the historical efforts made to preemptively end the violence of this kind of racist biological visualization, it also called attention to the ways that we would have to consider the biological for our critiques. What I found myself having to ask at the beginnings of my research from this point, from this particular origin story, was what did it mean to say that race was not biologically real when the genetic test results were forcing us to visually intuit this to be the case? Was there a way to break that, this racially essentialized and genetic vision wide open, to put it to an end? How much of this would depend on an ethnographic effort to envision a new way that ancestry could be made beyond the confines of biological determinism? 
And how much have we been underestimating Africa's ability to provide insight? In part, addressing these questions means accepting that we do not have a choice in the matter. According to MIT Technology Review, nearly 26 million people have taken genetic ancestry tests as of 2019, with as many consumers submitting samples of their saliva to Silicon Valley in 2018 as all previous years combined. Long gone are the days in the mid to late 2000s when 23andMe had to host quote unquote spit parties during New York Fashion Week to solicit interest in their new venture into personalized genomics. Today, we encounter this biotechnology in Lizzo lyrics, Old Navy marketing puns, and the popular PBS series, Finding Your Roots, hosted by Henry Louis Gates Jr as well as bipartisan political strategies to manage the family separation crisis along the US-Mexico border. This is essentially a reflection of what sociologist Alondra Nelson calls, quote unquote, the social life of DNA. Today, we have to consider where, quote unquote, where and why genetics is called upon to answer fundamental questions about human existence. The fungibility of genetic ancestry makes it as much a fact of popular culture as it is a seamless tool to fortify national borders through state investments in a naturally biogenetically constituted all-American nuclear family. But there may be no clear indication, no clear indication of the growing significance of these applications beyond the boundaries of biological thinking than the prospect of market saturation facing the direct-to-consumer market test industry today. Only a year after direct-to-consumer test purchases reached an all-time high, Recode reported that 23andMe and Ancestry.com saw a 48% and 15% decline in the end-of-year holiday sales, respectively. Without the steady stream of genetic data being provided by test takers, other partnerships to maintain a competitive edge within the industry are unfolding. In August 2020, the investment firm, for instance, Black Blackstone LLC became a majority stakeholder in Ancestry through a $4.7 billion investment deal. This reason is unclear exactly where genetic ancestry is headed in the realm of venture capital in the United States, but it is clear that Africa is a space where it may be quite natural to redirect the trajectory. If we are willing to release Africa from the confines of an ambivalent African-American diasporic imaginary. A little less than a century before Perry's unexpected genomic presence, Harlem Renaissance poet County Cullen would publish his poem, Heritage, offering the paradigmatic refrain of diasporic belonging. What is Africa to me? Copper sun or scarlet sea, jungle star or jungle track strong bronze men or regal black, women from whose loins I sprang when the birds of Eden sang, one three centuries removed from the scenes his fathers loved, spicy grove, cinnamon tree, what is Africa to me? With each statement, repetition is the only means of breaking and bending what is otherwise treated as a rhetorical question. Africa is ephemeral and fleeting far gone from anything that can be felt or held as one's own. And yet today, genetic information is enabling Africa to have a different kind of presence. In 2009, actor Isaiah Washington gained international attention not for his acting chops on Grey's Anatomy, but instead for setting a new precedent for 21st century Pan-Africanist possibilities. He became the first African-American to be offered dual citizenship based on DNA test results. It would be another year until Washington took the oath of citizenship. As a new recipient of a green passport to accompany his royal blue one, Washington told Sierra Leonean President Ernest Bay Caroma he was quote unquote honored to be the first African-American to be granted citizenship in this way. But he affirmed confidently he would surely not be the last. He was right. In 2019, 
while the United States was engaged in a nationalist debate about whether it was accurate to redefine the country's origins to 1619 with the arrival of 20 enslaved Africans to Jamestown, Virginia, Ghana used the year to initiate the year of return. That August, Cape Coast Castle was host to Africa's largest genetic ancestry testing reveal, in which 70 families learned of their ancestry. By the end of the year, more than 100 African Americans and Afro-Caribbeans were given citizenship. I do not know when, whether any of these circumstances overlapped. However, it's hard to ignore their notable proximity particularly with respect to the resonances heard within President Nana Akufo Addo's remarks on the importance of offering citizenship. We recognize our unique position as the location of 75% of slave dungeons built on the west coast of Africa through which the slaves were transported. That is why we had a responsibility to extend the hand of welcome back home to Africans in the diaspora. Today, the commodification of ancestry through direct-to-consumer testing has not so much clarified what ancestry is, but instead, who has the power to define what it could be? So it might not be African Americans simply asking, what is Africa to me? But the more pressing question, instead, increasingly becoming, what can African Americans be to Africa? So in closing, a part of what I want us to be considering is not just the idea of refracting kind of biological vision and the ideas of what it means to potentially return the ideas around, return our ideas of ancestry back to the continent, but how might we be rethinking our ideas of ancestry when we consider the ethics of what it means to be sharing ancestry are taking share in, ancest in ancestry with others. This is a part of the work that I am doing in terms of thinking about ancestry from Cameroon. For those who are not as familiar, Cameroon is known as Africa in miniature, which is particularly interesting for trying to rescale African ancestry to the level of nucleotides. Located at the interstices of West and Central Africa, the nickname is on the one hand a reference to the ecological diversity holding within it all the different ecological systems that can be found in the African continent. But it is also a historical, cultural, and linguistic signifier of the dynamic processes that have shaped modern Africa. With a name derived from Portuguese explorers' observation of shrimp, camaroes, in the Douala River that, depending on who you ask, may not have in fact been shrimp. Cameroon's borders not only reflect the profoundly arbitrary carving of Africa over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, from German Cameroon to a dissolution into French Cameroon and the protectorates of the northern and southern British Cameroons, to the contentious dynamics of reunification that made the republic as we know it today. Within these changing borders, born from colonialism, is a space in which more than 250 indigenous languages are spoken today. As I am reminded in moments that I've had people literally ask me why Cameroon, it seems to be less about the question of trying to understand this as an obvious why, but the fact that more often than not, they cannot make a kind of sense of how this would start there in the first place. Under these kinds of dynamics, there is no kind of obvious one-to-one -one kind of assumption that this would be a kind of place in which genetics, the kind of essentializing dynamics of genetics would somehow take hold. And yet, what I try to offer to us through my own work is a kind of way that what is unique about Cameroon as a kind of space to think about the biological, biological metaphors of ancestry are the ways that Cameroon kind of dynamism refracts in the same ways that genetic information does. And so, in concluding a part of the talk, 
I'll say a bit about what my work is for the actual book project itself. And so, insofar as what I'm trying to do in Cameroon is kind of refracting a biological vision, so much of it has to do with trying to think about the work of sharing ancestry not as a kind of embodied endowment, even if genetic information is involved, but rather, insofar as the idea is to deal with prospecting, it's trying to hold that space, trying to understand what exactly is about what's going on in Cameroon in the present moment, in which there is a kind of zeitgeist to change not only the ideas of what Cameroon has been, but the kind of convergence of the emergence of genetic information to make possible with African Americans an opportunity to rethink what Cameroon could be. And so in part, one of the reasons why I've included the image that I have up here for you all is that the issue of genetics, when you get to Cameroon, has in many respects nothing to do with the science, but the kind of stories which people are able to newly tell about themselves. And so for instance, with this image, this comes from a moment in field work in which I was also in the Western grass, grass fields specifically a bit further north than where the Bamaleke tend to be, um, in the Tikar territory. And, and my guide here was talking to me. One of the things that was notable when I was in the, this particular village was how much the land seemed to engulf the people around who lived there. And when I say engulfed, I'm, say, I'm pointing to the fact that for many of the, despite the kind of ways that land is so essential to how one considers home, it was almost as if the land was empty, empty of people. It was almost all land. And what I would come to find, that person would explain to me as we would look out, out into these many, many acres of land over these various hills, was that a part of the legacy, a different kind of afterlife of slavery on this side of the Atlantic, is that this kind of undeveloped land also becomes a consistent reminder of the people who were lost, who were taken, and who are not actually able to make a life out of the land that's before them. And so in terms of prospecting, in the idea not necessarily of sharing biological ancestry, but taking share in the everyday realities of life in Cameroon. What I'm hoping to kind of demonstrate in my book is what does it mean not only just to sacrifice our ideas of the biological, but sacrifice the kind of worlds that have been built on it together. In what ways, in this kind of similar aspects of how Albert Perry provided a kind of way of dispossessing us of the ideas of how slavery could be omitted and erased. In what ways could, for the sake of these genetic reconnection programs, not just the 10 days in which African Americans are there, but specifically in the time after they leave in the hopes that they will be coming back, in what ways does it become possible to speculate to reimagine materially what it could mean to bring folks home, to make kin, to make family, and most importantly, to make a different kind of future. Thank you all. I apologize, it was very short. I have a mic here. If you have questions, you want to raise your hand, I'll bring the mic around. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for a very provocative presentation. Um, there are many things I want to ask you about, but, but you said, um, what can African Americans be to Africa? And would you, Elaborate on your own thoughts about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, and can I, before you give away the mic, can I ask if there are any, as I can go in a whole, both, a whole host of different directions, and maybe is there any particular kind of thing that's coming up for you with that question? 
Several things. You talked about the land and the connection to land. Yeah. Um, and I think that for African Americans here in the United States, there has been um, a disconnect to land for many reasons. Yeah. Land being taken away from families. So th that would be the central point. Um, and then beyond Cameroon, what does it mean in terms of this search yeah. for connectedness? Okay, great, thank you. With respect to the kind of point of land, it's interesting because that, that was actually the thing that struck me most about um, my first encounter with these discussions around genetic reconnection in Cameroon specifically. Um, during the first program, it didn't happen after the open discussions in terms of people expressing interest that they want to buy land. Um, but what was particularly unique about the ARPs was that and the kind of ways that Cameroonians who were of a particular kind of class and hence had a certain kinds of means were able to help facilitate this program and again to bring African Americans back basically at no cost, um, except for the plane ticket. One of the things that was done was that one, one person, a wealthy landowner, genuinely moved by just literally seeing um, African Americans arrive, gave people parcels of land. Um, I say this to say not then to like go to Cameroon and think you're gonna have someone come and give you land that is not going to happen. I mean, it might, but. Um, definitely not happening from the state, as I've heard, like, you know, other places, like particularly Ghana, having kind of infrastructure for that, particularly for people from the diaspora. But I point out the issue of land. Maybe it also kind of get at this question of, again, what can, in redirecting the County Cullen question of what is Africa to me, and again, the me being an African American, to the question of, from Cameroon, a kind of new question arising of what can African Americans be to Africa, in this case, Cameroon, One of the things that has been kind of coming up in the work around the, the land gifts has been over the past decade, um, what to do with the fact that people haven't necessarily done anything with it thus far. And I say that, I point it out that way as a kind of reflection of what I've had to contend with ethnographically as a researcher that I think on the one hand, it's very clear and easy to like, see how generous it is to give land. Land is not something you take lightly anywhere, um, not anywhere in the world, um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, but a part of that, I think, especially in a kind of proprietary sense, especially in the US, this assumption that you have land and you do something with it. There's kind of immediacy. Um, that immediacy is not the same. And so the kind of what can African Americans be has a lot to do with how are people holding that potential? Which is to say, as the kind of roots and the, the weeds grow over these, gift, these, land, these land gifts that at the time and still today, were literally marked by their names, the names of the people that they were given. Um, you know, now, more than a decade later, based on just nature itself, it's very hard to even find those, those names, the, the um, tags anymore. Or even if you see one, the name has been otherwise overtaken by kind of um, moss and other kinds of roots. But nonetheless, when I was talking to people, I often had to be confronted by, I think from a kind of American standpoint, the kind of need to project that as a kind of failure. That with every kind of weed that's inching up and kind of almost making the land gifts, these, these unique parcels becoming yet just another kind of um, part of the bush around us, that somehow, there, there, there's nothing to be had with what could be with this. Again, the African Americans had failed their kin. And that has never been the, the goal. 
not only the kind of thinking about this as, a, as is kind of named in the gifts themselves, the deeds, that is living, kind of given in a, as a kind of act of love, but in genuinely not being cynical. And I think that's again the kind of researcher, academic, American kind of component of always needing to be cynical about particularly the things you cannot see. Um, learning to have the kind of humility to hold that for folks who are living around it, and again, that notion of protection, of protecting the potential. It's not just that the land is a kind of very clear material way to compel people to come back, even if they haven't come back yet. But for many folks who are living around the land, that the immediacy is not the problem, that the immediacy is not the goal. The goal is infrastructure. The goal is not in compelling people to come back, is to, despite the kind of state abandoning them, abandoning them in a town that has become the kind of quintessential economic hub for kind of Cameroon's own kind of national economic futurity, that as they are being rendered disposable, that the prospect of, the, of African Americans coming back it gives them the opportunity to take seriously that if they do, if slash when they do, the African Americans would not be settling for the standard of living that they themselves are being forced to deal with. That these dreams are not just abstractions, they're very, very material. The prospects of hospitals and schools and that, I mean, I think that the, that's truly a kind of world-making practice, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think that's one, <laughs> what that means, maybe in Cameroon. But in terms of the question of beyond, I think what's really fascinating of what's been happening, and again, I mentioned a bit about Sierra Leone and Ghana, is that On the one hand, there are other places that are contending with the possibilities or what could be possible with kind of bringing African Americans home with genetics today. I don't know if any particular way is good or bad, but maybe what I just find hopeful, and I'm trying to say hopeful also not being naive, um, is that the very kind of simplest kind of aspect, there's a kind of, democratization of power in the sense of typically when we talk about um, pilgrimages, um, diasporic tours, roots, roots tours, there's a kind of thank you for grantedness that African Americans and Africans are not on the same page. They can't be. And I think what I find especially compelling from the Cameroonian case at least is that there's something being leveled here, um, leveled in a way that I think on the diasporic side, it's not just us kind of dealing with our own desires to, be, to go home, to reclaim home. I don't know if the absolute reclamation is, or recovery is inherently possible, but in what ways is that not inherently a problem? If we're able to recognize one another particularly in one another circumstance, um, and invest ourselves mutually to move forward. I think in terms of the beyond, that's maybe what I see. Did that answer your question? Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, what is it? There was um, an elder who I, I, I spoke to, and it's a part of the basis of one of the chapters of the book project, but the kind of idea that the, the goal, especially in trying to make these, the infrastructure, the, the work of, make, of these kin being a kind of infrastructure that is otherwise not there, is having to take the perspective of working small and growing. It's genuinely the little things um, that is gonna testify to whether something can come out of this. Um, and that's precarious and that can be terrifying. <laughs> I don't want to like I don't want to take that lightly. 
um, especially given sometimes the way that certain kind of historical circumstances unfold. And I think um, a whole host of pressures unfolding that make it seem as if, again, a certain kind of past is just inevitably going to be reinscribed. And yet again, the small, the gaps, the is a kind of way to kind of hold on to kind of taking a leap of faith or walking in faith, operating in faith with how one can ethically engage with what's doing the least amount of harm in the process. Hi, thank you for that very cool talk. Um, this is a, maybe a little bit of a zoom out from the, um, the first question, but I can't help um, but see this amazing presentation in uh, this building, in this place, like full of abstract art and art in general, and uh, that's kind of, um, uh, you know, as a device, like flattens uh, meaning and flattens like an ability to like read uh, um, something maybe, and then allows for a certain kind of like projection into space or projection into meaning like from the user. And I thought that, when I heard that great story about how you teach and you taught us like by showing the genetic sequence, um, it's a kind of abstraction of identity. It's a kind of abstraction of like who we are, a kind of flattening in the same way that a lot of the work that we see in this building produces a certain kind of flattening. And, and it sort of taught me, and I wondered if you could reflect on the space between how we understand the abstraction of that definition of self as um, say, uh, a contemporary collection of evidence that exists like contemporaneously now, and ancestry as an idea that's like projected into history, uh, and given that depth that we're, and, and you're showing that as almost like a rhetorical projection yeah. that we're defining our own history or, you know, the uh, African-American um, uh, or, you know, um, project of ancestry is also projecting a history in that way. Um, and you know, it's linked to different things. And I think, you know, your, the last question, you were linking it to place. It's linked to like population, it's linked to language, it's linked to these ideas that in some ways are very unstable um, as notions. And so therefore mm -hmm. like also lend themselves as they project into history to like, you know, I would say lots of um, agendas or yeah. values that are like actually coming from a contemporary discourse. And I think that's something that to me was really interesting about the talk. and. I think that, you know, anyway, something about the abstraction of the work that's like even behind your, uh, your, your slides that to me is, is uh, seeing that, that moment of relief and that moment of flattening is a really interesting like parallel. No, thank you for, for pointing. I, I appreciate that that, that came, that was made clear. Um, and I say that because, you know, one of the things, one, it's just exciting. I think what was nice for me to kind of present in this space was to really think about how to actually um, <laughs> give the focus on <laughs> being in an, uh, the Manila collection, thinking about art, the visual, like how do I actually tell a story to visualize this flattening? Um, but I, I'm, the, the kind of work of doing that has a lot to kind of deal with. For me, the tension that often comes up amongst scholars, many of whom I deeply respect, even if I have a slightly different kind of perspective, um, is that we too often, again, that image of the <laughs> genetic sequence is really important for that, is that we, we, it's not even just ancestry and projecting depth, it's literally the kind of assumption of depth we give when we're dealing with biology, when we take for granted that genetics we use genetics as a kind of placeholder for our biological thinking, but we don't actually take a moment to step back and think whether the same kinds of depths that have been imbued to biology proper from the beginning, um, the kind of origins of various disciplines, including anthropology, taking on that metaphor, if they actually still hold, right? When we are thinking about biology, again, that, that process of literally how to read is a different kind of way of interrogating the kind of biological kind of scientific knowledge production process, right? It is visual, it is about the ocular, it is about the, the um, I'm trying to say telescope, but that is not the actual um, device that I'm thinking about, a microscope, right? The idea that you, you are looking down at something, but in that kind of observation, that there's something, there's an essence, 
right? There is something, some essential thing, some essential process, some natural process that you are capturing. It can go on without you. You have nothing to do with it. It's just, it is just there. It just is. It's the ways that we get the, again, that racism biological. It's not just about biology. It's about the idioms of essence proper, that there is something in you that we can see the kind of maybe collapse in the kind of genetic terms of phenotype and genotype, that you just are what I see. And because we, I think, at times scholars know how violence um, the eugenic kind of histories of the kind of biological thinking. We spend so much time preemptively trying to capture the potential to be biological that we're almost conceding ground that actually isn't necessarily even there. And I think for me, it's again, I'm, I'm genuinely not trying to be naive when I pose this, but it's just genuinely trying to kind of think about even just the basic levels of curiosity as a tool what does it mean to just genuinely just doubt, <laughs> to ask, to take a step back and think about how do we know exactly what we know? Are we seeing what we actually say we're seeing? Um, what, what other kinds of, again, frameworks are we mobilizing that we're just taking for granted? And I think if we don't just find ways to actually flatten, we're not gonna see the actual work that's being done to kind of project depth that we use to critique that again is more about, um, I think often, a need to hold on to a certain kind of self-righteousness about how we, especially when it comes to race and ancestry, know things are supposed to always be when the world around us is completely changing foundations of those thought. And it's, it's scarier to kind of deal with that than to actually, um, it's easy, it's not scary, well it is scary, but maybe the thing I'm trying to say, it's easier to kind of continue to depend on what we've already, we've always said, the rhetoric, um, than have to try to develop something new. Is that, was that an adequate response? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for this presentation. I, it made me think, um, as a Jamaican, about Sashimine, um, the uh, Rasta commune in Ethiopia mm -hmm. um, that like Haile Selassie gave a tract of land um, to Rastafarians um, and so I was wondering if you'd ever kind of done comparisons with like other like kind of repop like those like repopulation moments and those yeah. other diasporas because when you were talking about storytelling yeah that's what it made me think of, of like you don't actually have any new information about your literal lineage but you tell yourself a new story and like the kind of successes and failures of like that commune yeah i haven't um not in the land at this time and that's that has more to do with one um the work of trying to kind of, I mean, one, it's the trying to kind of finish the work in terms of the dissertation process initially. That was unfortunately, well, it's not unfortunately, just the timing, doing it during COVID. And so there are a lot of just like aspects, especially when it comes to the land gifts that have not been kind of dealt with. Um, for me so far, so I mean, maybe I'm saying this to say I appreciate the evocation of this and, and I intend to, I just haven't quite done it yet. Um, but rather, so far, a lot of the connections I've been having to deal with have been more the kind of parallels, almost like what ends up being most obvious in the Cameroonian context is the kind of distinct ways that the kind of material aspects of how kinship is being made and kind of compelled for African Americans ends up offering a kind of critique of the legacy of Americans previously, both in the African continent, but also um, in Cameroon specifically. So like for instance, with the land gifts um, that I had been mentioning earlier, um, one of the unanticipated things that I had not expected was that, again, the, <clears throat> the gift of land was just given, um, but it turns out it was in a small town that still bears the mark of abandonment by American Presbyterian missionaries. Um, 
at the end, uh, right after Reconstruction. And so despite these kind of ideas of, um, it's a different kind of storytelling of kind of how the American empire tried to remake itself um, through Cameroon by trying to abolish slavery, um, particularly through almost like a spiritual kind of colonialism as people mentioned it to me at the time during field work. Um, but so the, I'm pointing that to say that it's almost, it's been so far less, I've been having to deal with the kind of issues around community um, and its failures between a kind of whiteness of America and Cameroon so far, um, and not necessarily um, the communal engagements around blackness per se with other places on the continent, but it's something I'm engaging, I'm going to be engaging, I just haven't done it yet. Does that make, yeah. Thank you for this insightful presentation. I'm originally from Cameroon, from the Grassville. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's just hard for me to see somebody who's working in Africa, especially in Cameroon. Um, you do a lot, um, I think that you are a medical anthropologist. Yes. Um, do you work with people who collect like samples, genetic samples? Not formally, mm -hmm. um, and I say that to say that um, one of the just one of the again these unexpected moments of field work. Um, so, if people are not aware with the state of genetic ancestry today, it's not necessarily just people the kind of people outside of like the, the places of origin taking a test to find out their ancestry from X. Um, a lot of places have made sure, there's a kind of way that um, basically the tests have evolved in such a way that it's, less, it's not always about kind of finding the place, but finding people who are taking the tests. So this is a long-winded way of me trying to get to your question of, um, one of the things that I did not expect that happened when I was in Cameroon last during field work um, was that was, there was a move to test um, royal families um, in the Western region. Um, and you know, that's, that is very complicated in large part because on the one hand, there's just even on the Cameroonian side, what, what does it mean to even like talk about the royal family's kind of own engagements with the slave trade period. Um, but then it's also the kind of way that royalty shows up in the African American, particularly like kind of imaginary of what, what the ancestors were. Um, they were kings and queens, whatever that means, not necessarily. But what has come out of that is a kind of opportunity for Cameroonians then to take the test. Um, and so I, I witnessed people having, like having a DNA test, like doing their kind of testing on that side as opposed to over here. And a part of the work I was doing was also seeing what that conjures for the people who were lost in Cameroon. Again, we, we talk, it's almost like in this kind of discussion around ancestors, ancestry, that the loss is always on this side yeah. and not on the other. You know, not the, as it was often articulated, as a kind of like grandparents. It's not to say like that they were explicitly like your mothers, or like fathers, like parents, but just the kind of figure of grandparents who just disappeared. And what does it mean to kind of, when one connects to an American to have a kind of different story be told about, oh, this is where they, they landed. Um, yeah, that's what I've seen so far with people taking tests, but not the kind of medical anthropology proper, like the, the idea of like, I'm, I'm, taking a t I'm testing people or, yeah, it was, it was more kind of random circumstance. Um, and then just me interviewing people who had happened to have taken part in that process, but yeah. Uh, 
Anybody else? Thank you, Dr. Massey. Thank you all.